now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning. Welcome to the Hump Day edition of The Real Investment Show. Glad you could join us this morning. Get by our website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Latest blog post is out from Michael Leibowitz this morning talking about QT, right? That's that quantitative tightening, the Fed reducing the size of the balance sheet. Well, that goes to $95 billion starting today. And, you know, this has been kind of an interesting discussion here. You know, uh, the Federal Reserve talked about tightening their balance sheet earlier this year. They actually started quantitative tightening back in really June. And of course, a lot of people were emailing us at the time saying, well, their balance sheet's not really going down. Well, there's some things we need to understand about quantitative tightening and how it works. Um, but more importantly, it started out at a slower pace, started out at 60, then with 75 and 95. So they kind of ramped up the tightening process. Now, this doesn't mean that the Federal Reserve is selling bonds, right? So this is one of the big misconceptions is that when, you know, quantitative tightening is occurring, the Fed's just dumping bonds, $95 billion a month. They're going to reduce their balance sheet and, and throw out $95 billion a month onto the markets. And of course, somebody's got to buy those bonds. And, you know, so that's the big concern. But that's not really the way it works. Um, you know, what happens is the Federal Reserve is looking to reduce their balance sheet. That is true, right? That's a true statement. But does that mean they're actually selling bonds? That's not necessarily true. So when, over the last few years, the Federal Reserve has been buying a lot of very short-dated bonds, you know, in, in terms of their maturity. So, you know, one-year, two-year, three-year type bonds uh, that are on their books. And, and of course, now remember, we were doing QE you know, going all the way back to 2009. And so, you know, if you start looking at they were buying 10-year treasuries back then, well, a lot of those bonds are very close, you know, through QE1, 2, and 3. A lot of those bonds that we bought early on on the balance sheet are now getting closer to maturity. So what happens at each month is bonds mature, the Federal Reserve has an option. And so when they're just maintaining the size of the balance sheet, as some bonds mature, they just buy some matching bonds, put those back on the books, keep the balance sheet the same size. When they want to do quantitative tightening, they just let the bonds mature and they don't replace them. And so on any given month, you know, there was uh, some interesting emails I got. I was like, well, the Fed bought, you know, $5 billion worth of bonds last month. Could be the case. Right. So the, the claim is, is since they bought bonds are obviously not tightening their balance sheet, they're still doing QE. That's not really the case. And here's the example. So let's say that we're going to do ninety five billion dollars a month of, uh, a month of QE. Right. And this month there's one hundred billion dollars worth of maturities that are occurring. Well, the Fed doesn't need to, to, to sell anything because those bonds will just mature. But again, they're only wanting to, to reduce the balance sheet, the, the, the amount of assets, by $95 billion. So they'll go in and buy $5 billion worth of bonds because they had $100 billion mature. Right? So this is why sometimes you see, when you look at the balance sheet, you see these additions by the Federal Reserve. It's just because they're replacing what was in excess of the, the amount they wanted to, to remove from the balance sheet. So again, if there's more than 100 billion, you know, they just replace the difference between 95 and, and 100 billion or whatever. Now, if there's less than $95 billion maturing, so let's say in September, only $60 billion worth of bonds mature, then they will have to sell $35 billion worth of bonds, right, to get to the 95 billion. So it's not as clear cut as a lot of people make it out to be is that, oh, the Fed's just dumping bonds in the markets. Also, you know, this is a split between mortgage backed securities and treasuries as well. Now, mortgage backed securities are a little bit more problematic now because with interest rates up, people aren't refinancing bonds. So they're not getting paid down as quickly. Uh, what do we call prepayment speeds on mortgage bonds? Those aren't occurring as quickly. So that may be a bit more of, a, of an issue. Uh, as they're trying to reduce their balance sheet on the mortgage side, that they may actually have to sell some of those bonds on the mortgage side of the business because they're not maturing as quickly or as timely as normally expected because of, of what happens in the normal pay down cycle of mortgages. So there's a few things to consider. It's not, when you're talking about QT, 
it's not as clear cut as just, oh, they're just selling bonds in the market. And this is going to make interest rates go to the moon. Interest rates have moved up here over the last week or so, but that's more of an anticipation of the Fed continuing to hike rates. Now, after the Jackson Hole Summit, the Fed was saying, hey, we're very focused on inflation. And right now we've got strong employment data. So we're very focused on that. So we're going to keep hiking rates. In fact, the market right now expects the Fed to hike rates by 140 basis points by next year. So that's, you know, we're two and a quarter now, roughly. Add another 140 basis points to that. You're starting to approach 4%. That's the, what they call the terminal rate for the Federal Reserve. That's where they're expected to stop hiking rates is at 4%. The problem, as we've talked about before, is that the economy is slowing down rather rapidly. And we're seeing this on a lot of different fronts. CEO confidence is now at recessionary territory. In fact, the last time we talked about CEO confidence, now this is a survey taken of CEOs around the country, and they say, well, how do you feel about your business? But the last time that CEOs were this gloomy on the outlook for the economy was in 2019. And we wrote an article talking about the fact that when CEO confidence is this low, employees typically don't like what happens next, right? Because it's where terminations and layoffs come. And that was in October. We wrote that article. Of course, in March, we're having massive layoffs. And, you know, it's always interesting that we say, well, you know, the virus caused that, right? The pandemic shut down. But it was interesting because the, the market was already telling us confidence surveys, et cetera, were already telling us that there was a problem in the economy. And as we said back then, what it would take is some exogenous event to really kind of just trip things up. So, you know, we weren't going into the economic shutdown with all cylinders firing on the economy. There were already problems. The, the Federal Reserve was doing a reverse repo, bailing out banks and hedge funds through the end of 2019, moving into 2020. The National Federation of Independent Business, we wrote an article on this, all kinds of signals coming out of NFIB that were talking about a potential for a recession. So the economy was not in a great position to be impacted by the virus and the economic shutdown. Had the economy been really growing strongly, right? And then we shut down the economy. Maybe the, the, the economic downturn would, would have still been there. Maybe we would have still been in a recession, but it wouldn't have been as deep. So again, just because the virus was the trigger event to the recession, it doesn't mean the economy wasn't already headed in that direction. Well, now we're seeing those exact same signals again from the CEO confidence survey, from the National Federation of Independent Business Surveys, all telling you that a recession is coming probably next year. And that's something we'll talk about this morning a little bit more with Danny Radliff, who's going to join me here. We got quite a few things to go to. Uh, Warren Buffett turning 92. He's got some, uh, some, some uh, advice for us in terms of investing at his age. Uh, of course, everybody celebrating his birthday, just tweeting out all his typical, you know, uh, historical lines that he's given at one time or another. So just his advice floating around. Uh, talk a little bit more about the economy this morning, because, again, as we start talking about where the markets are going to, economics are going to drive it. Now, yesterday, very quickly, before we go to break, market did break that 50-day moving average just barely. Look, this is a level we need to hold here. This is what defines that uptrend that we're in right now. Markets are set to try to rally a little bit this morning. We tried that yesterday morning, completely gave that up on stronger jolts data. We'll talk about why that was important in a minute. But again, that slight break of the 50-day moving average needs to hold today. So by Friday, we need to get back above that 50-day moving average and go into the weekend holding that level. If not, we're gonna probably be retesting lows here sooner than later. So again, we, we talked about using rallies in order to hedge risk and rebalance portfolios. Continue to do that. Talk more about this after the break with Danny Ratliff. Don't go away. You're listening to The Real Investment Show, realinvestmentadvice.com. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. 
There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. Could your job still be at risk? A new normal can still include new obstacles. A severance package can be an emotional as well as a financial decision to consider. Wouldn't it be comforting to review the options for you and your family with an objective financial partner? At RIA Advisors, we're here to help. From severance pay tax timing decisions to how to maximize unemployment benefits, the RIA team wants to make sure you can do what's best for your family. There's no charge for a consultation, so reach out to RIA Advisors, 855-RIA-PLAN, riaadvisors.com. And now... Another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. the show this morning. So again, just talking about here uh, before the break, CEO confidence. Uh, this is a survey that is taken of CEOs around the country of both public and private companies. And they basically ask them a series of questions. What do you think about your business? What do you think about inflation? What do you think about the economy? Blah, blah, blah. And then they, you know, from all these different questions, they compile the survey index, which is now at levels we haven't seen since late 2019. And, and again, if you go to our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, and just type in CEO confidence in the search bar at the top of the page, it'll come up with the article that we wrote. And we said this was in October of 2019. We wrote that CEO confidence plunges, employees won't like what happens next. And of course, it wasn't too long after that. We got into March of 2020. We're in a recession, layoffs, job losses, et cetera. So, you know, we're now back in that same position. And it's not just, you know, and very much like October of 2019. In September and October of, of 2019, we were talking about a lot of stress in the economy back at that point. Um, we wrote an article about the NFIB, which is the National Federation of Independent Business. That's an organization of small businesses around the country. Another good kind of pulse of what happens economically. Back then, lots of alarm bells going off about the weakness in the economy, potential for a recession, et cetera. Same stuff we're having today. Just we have recently updated that article on our website as well. So, you know, we're seeing exactly the same type of data points that we saw back in 2019 that were warning. Now, this is important. Now, listen to what I'm saying. What these surveys warn about is they're not warning of a recession. They're not saying a recession is coming. What they're warning of is that the conditions for a recession are present. And this is very important to understand the difference. Because, again, just like in October of 2019, what these surveys were telling us is that the economy was very weak and all it would take is some exogenous event to trip the economy up into a recession. Some unexpected, unanticipated event, oh, like COVID, right? <laughs> And everybody stopped spending money and we have a recession, right? But had we not already been in a position of being very sick or, 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 or very weak, then the economy wouldn't have gotten sick from, from the virus, right? So this is, this is the, kind of the analogy is, you know, when you're healthy, right? You're working out, you feel great, you're eating right, you're doing all the right stuff. You don't get sick. 
But, you know, you work too much, you get kind of run down, you get stressed out about something, that your immune system drops, you're not eating right, you're not going to the gym because you're all bummed out, whatever. That's when you get sick because your defenses come down. That's what's happening in the economy right now. Those defenses are getting weaker. And we have a couple of impacts here. Yes, the Fed is hiking rates. That is going to make this economy weaker. That's just a function of how it works. And that's the intention of the Federal Reserve which is to weaken the economy, right? If I can weaken the economy through slowing demand, I get less inflation. That's what the Fed is trying to do. They're not trying to say, hey, I want to make the economy stronger. That's not what they want to do. A stronger economy means more inflation. So what they're hoping is, is they can slow the economy by hiking rates. But unfortunately, that's weakening the immune system of the economy. And if some unexpected exogenous event hits... And again, we never know what it is. The things we know about are priced into the markets, right? The markets are pricing in Fed rate hikes. That's done. What the market isn't pricing in is some exogenous event. I'm not saying it's going to be COVID, right? Nobody expected COVID, right? <laughs> you know, back in 2019, we were talking about Federal Reserve repos and China and, and, you know, trade wars and all kinds of other stuff. Nobody was talking about COVID. So we're talking about Russia, Ukraine. We know those things, right? Those are priced into the market. So it'll be something totally unexpected. You know, massive hurricanes. You know, it could be a variety of things, right? Just don't know what it is. But this is it. I mean, this is the this is the point that ran. There was a good, there was an interesting article out. Danny brought me this morning. We'll talk. We're going to talk about it. Economist predicts a whopper of a recession in 2023. And that's not necessarily due to higher interest rates. And And, and this is kind of the point that we're getting to. You know, the risk of a recession, we talked about this before, the risk of a recession is 2023, not in the first half of this year. That's still coming. But here, let me just, um, before I throw this to Danny, um, let me just read you a quote. We will have this, and he's pretty certain. I, I, I never go with this much certainty. I'm always hedging a little bit. Could be. He says, we will have, this is Steve Hankey, and by the way, he's a, we, we, we swap Twitter feeds quite a bit. <laughs> um, Steve Hankey uh, is a professor of applied economics at John Hopkins University, and, and we generally have a lot of interesting conversations on Twitter. Uh, we will have a recession because we've had five months of zero M2 money growth supply, um, money supply growth, and the Fed isn't even looking at that. And this is an interview that he was doing. He says, this is probably going to lead us into one big whopper of a recession in 2023. And that's a, that's a correct statement. The Fed isn't looking at the M2 money supply. But before I get into to that, Danny, your thoughts? Well, I think this is a, a good or a different perspective from what we're hearing each and every day. I mean, the, the language on the street is essentially we have inflation because of you know this or that or Ukraine, Russia. I mean, it... You know, one conversation I think that I have frequently is that, look, if we put together the list of headwinds that we have faced this year, last year, <laughs> this time, right. you'd have been like, yeah, right. OK, maybe one or two of those things occur, but not all of those together. And then even looking back at 2020, hey, by the way, right. we're going to have a, a shutdown, a global shutdown. Supply chains are going to be disrupted. We're going to give everybody money, but we're not going to tell them that they have to pay their discretionary or non-discretionary bills. They can just do what they want with it. And that's part of the problem, and that's yeah. what I think he's getting to as well, is that the M2 money supply has changed drastically because of all of those things that occurred back and how we treated the pandemic. And we had problems leading into it, just like you alluded to. You know, We had an uh, inverted yield curve back in 2018, mm -hmm. 2019 that continued. We had other issues that were just you know prevailing or continuous. And now we're in a situation where, um, you know, and I think one thing that we've talked about too is that the market went down this year before we found out that we were in a recession. I know, you know, we can look at the different definitions or whatever, you know, the administration wants to call it or, you know, what economists, but we're technically in a recession, correct? I mean, two negative quarters of, of growth. Well, so the National Bureau of Economic Research, this is the, the, the kind of given rule. It's a rule of thumb, right? Yeah. Two negative quarters of economic growth, you're in a recession. That's a rule of thumb. And that's actually globally, right? Correct. But the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the organization that dates the recessions, there's some other factors that feed into that. Okay. It's, it, the, the, what they're looking at is what caused the two negative quarters of GDP growth, yeah. right? 
So there's these other factors, and they go, okay, we had you know negative income growth, we had whatever it was, and this is what led to these two negative quarters. And what the National Bureau of Economic Research is trying to parse out is some exogenous event that triggers a slowdown economically versus an economic recession, which is a contraction in growth. And you know we're likely going to see a Q2 GDP revised up um, probably next year because once we get all the data in, because of strong employment, et cetera, mm-hmm. that'll probably get revised back up. You know, look, it's possible, and I'm not saying that, that the National Bureau of Economic Research won't date quarter one and quarter two as a recession. They certainly could. I know I'm not on that committee. But, <laughs> but I suspect they won't because I think they also see the trend of the data that's occurring and realizing that the, the actual recession is probably going to be coming next year. It's on the horizon. Yeah. So, so what does that mean for markets? I think it's the more important thing. Like, what do, what do people need to know? Because, look, it feels like we're in one, right? Mm-hmm. Markets are down substantially considering, you know, where things have been. And you may say it's not substantially, but 15, 20 percent. That's quite well, a you're bit. Still, you're still up 23 percent from where we were in 2020. I yeah, mean, but how many people are up that much? Well, I'm just saying on, on the S&P, right? So if you were in Correct. the S&P, right? So, I mean, you're still 23 percent higher than you were back in 2020. You know, and I, and I think, you know, so and that's the way the Fed looks at it, right? Because they look at the wealth effect. Yeah, but investors aren't looking at that. They're I, looking at I, they're looking at it a little differently because most investors have stocks and bonds. Uh, they're both down. Yep. Right. And so they're looking at their balance sheet and saying, hey, whoa, this is hurting quite a bit more. Yeah, so is. does the Fed start to look at that as well versus just looking at the, 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 the Fed, overall broad market? The Fed won't look at that. Yeah. Um, so the Fed doesn't look at. So first of all, investors have a very distorted view of their of their investing portfolios. Um, we do a terrible thing to ourselves, which is we anchor to January the first. No, that's right. Right, absolutely. Um, and instead of looking, and you know what we what we should do as investors that look at our portfolio over a three year time frame. Where 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 am I today versus three years ago, um, or even two years ago if you want to shorten it up a bit. But but carbon dating your portfolio from January first, December thirty first is a terrible way to measure your performance. Different story. We'll talk about that for another day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but. The Fed doesn't look at it. They look again. They look at the wealth effect over time. And again, the markets are higher than they were in 2020. And there's no stress in the markets, right? There's you know volatility remains low. Credit spreads remain very much in line. We talked about this in our investment committee meeting yesterday. We're not seeing signs of financial instability. And so as long as there's no signs of financial instability, the Fed's good to raise rates. They can focus on that. Now, once we start seeing credit spreads blow out something start to occur in the credit market, then they're going to focus on those things, right? That's where that becomes really important. Okay, so we're down, what, 15% for the year? Yeah. Um, bonds are down about 11 12% for the year. Mm-hmm. And there's no financial instability. And there's no financial instability, right? Okay. Nobody, and, and this is interesting, right? Every, you're, you're, what you're talking about, right, is like, you know, you talk to a lot of individuals every day, right? right? And they're very concerned about the markets. They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about the upcoming elections. I mean, they've got lots of concerns. Cash allocations are below the long-term average. Cash allocations and portfolios for most investors are very low. In other words, investors are terrified about the bear market and the upcoming recession, but they're not selling anything Stay because- invested. They're afraid of missing the bottom when the Fed pivots. And so that's the dichotomy that you got going on. And that's why there's no financial instability is because nobody's selling. Now, that's going to change at some point. You'll see the capitulation, right? But a lot of times we see the markets run out ahead of the economy. So what happens? We may find out we're smack dab in a longer recession than we anticipated. But does that mean the market tanks? Not necessarily. Because Fed may, they may think the Fed pivots. Exactly. It's the fear of missing out of a yeah. Fed pivot, right? We'll talk about that when we come back from the break. It's an interesting psychology point. Don't go away. More with Danny Ratliff right after the break. Get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive 
as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. I just was curious if anybody was actually still printing encyclopedias anymore. Can you go buy a set of encyclopedias in printed form? The World Book Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia is the only general A to Z print research source still published today, according to Google. Because I didn't have an encyclopedia handy. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. All these encyclopedia ads are going to show up in your screen. Uh, I know. Realinvestmentadvice.com. I'm logged into your website, so it's actually going to be on yours. <laughs> Anyone can sell you insurance, and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Have market gyrations caused you to lose sleep? If so, it's because you have more risk in your portfolio than you realize. It's time to reevaluate your long-term investing strategy with RIA Advisors. Our disciplined approach can help eliminate unnecessary risk. If you think it's time to work with an advisor who puts your interests first, it's time for Real Investment Advice. RIAadvisors.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. If you're watching our show on our live stream right now on YouTube, be sure and click the uh, like button and uh, give us a thumbs up. Also, click the little bell so we can uh, alert you. We're posting all kinds of new stuff all the time, and that way you'll get on our alerts. Have that available to you. Um, so just for the break, talking a little bit about, you know, this, you know, issue of a potential recession coming up and, and you know, the concerns about investors and Again, you know, we left off talking about the fact that despite the fact there's all these concerns about a recession and the markets are down 15, 16, 17 percent for the year, it's terrible, right? It's just, you know, everywhere you look, it's just horrible. Nobody's selling anything. And this is one of the this is one of the, this is a, an interesting phenomenon that's occurring, and it's all psychology. For the last 12 years, we have trained investors, and this is this, and, and what's very interesting about this, this is Pavlov's experiment to the T, where you introduce a, a, a stimuli and train investors in, or in, in Pavlov's, you know, Pavlov's experiment, dogs, right? He'd ring the bell. And he would feed the dogs, and eventually he could just read the bell, ring the bell, and the dogs would start to salivate, thinking they were going to get fed, right? So he didn't have to feed them; they would start to salivate just from the ringing of the bell. And that's that—that's that stimuli that gets 
you know, put into place and we get trained psychologically to do something because of that bell. And that bell for the Fed was QE. And since 2009, every time the markets have even hiccuped, right? I mean, we didn't have financial instability in 2010 or 2011, 2013. There was no financial instability. There was just a concern that there might be financial instability. You probably don't remember this, but in 2012, right, there was the, <laughs> the triple threat in Japan, right? So Japan had a tsunami that uh, well, there was an actual Nuclear offshore reactor. earthquake. Well, no, there was an offshore earthquake, right, first, that then yeah. triggered a tsunami that then destroyed, you know, the Fukushima reactor, which, you know, released Godzilla. And then we had the, the Godzilla movie after that, right? So he came back. But that all shut down manufacturing, right? So there was this concern. At the same time that was happening, we were having the debt ceiling default debate here in the U.S., right? And everybody was, and there was a big fight between the Obama administration, the Republicans over the debt ceiling. And there was a, finally an agreement made that there would be this bipartisan group of senators who would get together and they would come up with a, a trillion dollars worth of cuts. And if they didn't come up with these cuts by 2013, I'm sorry, this was, I said 2012, this was 2011. If they didn't come up with this by the end of 2012, these trillion dollars worth of cuts, they would automatically be injected across agencies in, in the government. And there was this thing called the fiscal cliff. Everybody was terrified of the fiscal cliff. So was the Fed. So Ben Bernanke, in late 2012, he launched QE3 and just injected a trillion dollars worth of liquidity through QE into the system, even though there was no financial instability, but he was worried about the fiscal cliff. Well, the problem was is that nobody realized those cuts would be spread across 10,000 agencies. It was an absolutely nothing burger that occurred. It didn't reduce our debt or deficits at all or our spending. It was all a political stunt. But the problem was is that there was this massive amount of liquidity that ran the market to the moon, right? So we had a, we had a year or so where the markets had less than 1% volatility. It just, it just ramped higher, right? 2013, 2014. Then we got into 2015, 2016. Our QE is running out. 2015, 2016, um, we get into Brexit. Big concern about the Brexit withdrawal and, and, and the, Euro, the UK is going to break away from the euro and it's going to just devastate the entire economy. And in February, March of 2016, markets are down like 20% for the second time over the course of like six months. There's lots of concern here. Janet Yellen gets on the phone with the ECB and Bank of England and says, hey, y'all better get your act together. We can't do QE here. You better do it over there. And they did. And markets recovered and, and went back up. Then we get into 2018. The Federal Reserve says, oh, we're going to start tapering our balance sheet and we're going to hike interest rates into September. Uh, this is where Donald Trump is in the middle of a trade war with China. Markets start to sell off. We get down about 20 percent. Fed's trying to taper their balance sheet. And all of a sudden, you know, the Fed says, oh, we're done. And they completely reverse everything. And a couple months later, we're back to zero interest rates. And the market's taking off. This is now 2019. And then, of course, the Fed's bailing out banks behind the scenes. And then 2020, the, kind of the, the virus hits, $120 billion a month of QE. We're bailing out junk bond markets. We're doing everything else. So the point is, is that for the last 12 years, every time there's been a hiccup in the financial markets, the Fed's rung the bell. And that's why we're saying earlier right now, nobody's selling anything because everybody's afraid if they sell and get out of the markets, the Fed's going to ring the bell and they're going to miss it. And that's the problem. Lance, is that just here, though? Because, I mean, if you go back and we start talking about international markets at the same time, look at what the ECB yeah. did, IMF. I mean, Christine it's, Lagarde, you look at Mario Draghi. I mean, they tried everywhere. to do austerity back in 2012, right? Yeah, they went in a double-dip recession and figured out, well, we can't do this. So they're doing the same yeah, exact thing yeah, we're doing. Well, no, and, and part of our QEs were bailing out, you know, the, the whole Greek debacle, right? Yeah. When when Greece was in the, the midst of potential default, they were going to kick Greece out of the Eurozone and it was going to be devastating and IMF had to go bail out all their loans. Yeah, I mean, look, and we also supply, we also, the Federal Reserve also puts a lot of money into the IMF. 
right? So we're yeah. not only just bailing out U.S., we're also bailing out everybody else, too. Yeah, that was an interesting dynamic there. The Germans were bailing out the Greeks. Yeah. <laughs> Neither one of them liked each other a whole lot. <laughs> exactly. But we're yeah. going to bail them out anyway. Uh, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, right? Um, anyway, so this is the problem, right? And, and nobody wants to sell anything because they're afraid of missing out, to Danny, to your point. And so, you know, look, we're down 15, 16%. If, if look, in any other world where, if we were back in 2000, 2000 or the 1990s or even the mid, to early 2000s, and you had all this stuff going on in the economy right now, markets probably be down 20, 30%, right? Not 15. And, and, this, and this, is, this is just a cycle that we're in right now. And again, this is why it's so difficult to make these kind of one-sided bets like, oh, I'm going to short the market because you're short the market and all of a sudden the market runs up, you know, 17% in three weeks and you're underwater and you're shorts again. It's a very difficult market to short. Well, but we've talked about the dynamic of this market. I mean, you thought back in June, okay, we got very overdone and we were down 20 to 30% on the S&P and the NASDAQ. Yeah. And we've been there. We had the snack back rebound here. Mm -hmm. Now what? So what does somebody do? You're in a 401k, you say... Man, you know what? I tried to ride this out. Then I got out. Things went back up a little bit. Do I get back in? I mean, there's so many different conversations people are having and thoughts. Yep. I mean, what do you do when you're in this stage? Well, no, it's the same thing. We you know use rallies to reduce risk. Yep. You know, you can add a little bit of stuff when you get really oversold. And, and you know, just kind of the way that we've been navigating it this year, right? Just trying to nibble here and take a little off. We got, you know, we bought some stuff near the bottom and we sold it too early, unfortunately, because the market ran up and you know, we thought we that was about it, and it just went further than we expected. And that's going to happen from time to time. But again, you just kind of reduce risk where you can and and take advantage of opportunities. But you know, you know, the the thing that is very difficult to predict right now is that you know I think there's a very high probability we have a recession. Does that mean markets are going to go down another 30, 40, 50 percent from here? The answer is probably not. And the reason is we've talked about recently. Is, is and we talked about this in the newsletter last weekend, is the fact that there's so much money moving into passive ETFs. Everybody's buying ETFs now instead of individual equities. 33 cent, basically 30 cents of every dollar goes into the top 10 stocks of the S&P. So that keeps the market elevated from those money flows. And it also makes it very difficult. You know, you see stocks like PayPal, which are down like 60%, 70%, and Apple's like 5% off of its all-time highs. You know, there's this big dichotomy in the markets because of all that money flow that goes into those top 10 stocks because of ETFs and passive indexing. It's distorted the... The, the overall broad the, market. Well, it's, it's distorted. Yeah, it's distorted the overall market, but it's distorted price discovery in stocks. You can't go buy you can't go buy a small company that's cheaply valued and expect it to do great because it doesn't get money flows from ETFs. Well, because you have these mega cap stocks that make up a it, large it, percentage it, of it, those. It, yeah, it absorbs ETFs. all the cash yeah. flow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a problem. But this this look, this is what all makes it all very frustrating. And I wish I had the answer to it. It was like, yeah, you know, I, you know, we hear all these, you know, guys on the media and, you know, podcasts or whatever, and they're like, oh, the world's about to end. It's like, yeah, maybe. But that doesn't mean the market's going to crash. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that 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 are keeping the markets elevated. Well, will that reverse? Maybe, but in order for that to reverse, you've got to get investors scared enough to start dumping their ETFs. And again, cash allocations are well below long term averages. There is no fear in the markets, and so there's no incentive right now for investors to go dump their ETFs. Wait a second, ETFs aren't safe. Well, that's what I'm saying. I know. That's what, that's what people think. Well, but I, th I think people have been lulled to sleep over time. I mean, we talked about it last year. Very little volatility. When mm -hmm. we get a little bit, it's going to feel a lot worse than it really is. And the it's just weird because you're not seeing the big volume on those down days like you typically would. Right. I know. Exactly. All right. Uh, when we come back, uh, Buffett turns 92. Let's talk about it. And, of course, now, you know, everybody's kind of in, in celebration of his 92nd birthday. Um, he's he's really he's been dead like 15 years. Um, it's kind of like weekend at Bernie's. He's got like doubles standing up for him. Uh, but at 92, no, he's he's still alive. I'm just teasing. At 92, people are sharing a lot of his timeless wisdom. We'll come back and talk about some of that when we come back from the break. Is it really good wisdom for you though? We'll talk about it. Don't go away.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment show and welcome back to the show this morning so um, just real quick before we get into Buffett's timeless advice uh, this morning the battleship Texas is on its uh, voyage down to Galveston Copper Shipyards to get refurb so Brent is Brent is a longtime volunteer and worker for the battleship texas to you know there was a big fight for a while there was uh, you know big concerns you know the the ships has been docked there on, in, in san jacinto now for a very long time and it was needing lots of needs of big repairs and it was real concern that nobody's going to repair it and you know we we're going to lose this kind of monument finally after a couple of years of just you know trying to get funding put together and everything finally got it all done now it's down on its way to get refurbed and then it'll find a new home somewhere. There's a, a bit of bidding around right now between Beaumont, Baytown, and Galveston. Correct. Uh, for a potential new home for the Battleship Texas. But if you're hanging out in Galveston, you'll see it kind of being towed down to Galveston today. Yeah. It's on its way, right? Very cool. Yes. They just they just pulled it out of the, uh, of the, the dock, I guess, at San Jacinto. And tugboats are taking it down the ship channel. There's a... Uh, there's a live cam on top of the monument, right? And you can still see it in the frame, but it's moving down the channel right now. Interesting. So, if, so is that restaurant still in yes. San Jacinto? Well, it's now called the Monument Inn. The right. original San Jacinto Inn was blown away by a hurricane. Right, right. And so the Monument Inn is next door to the Lynchburg Ferry, and that's still there. And so. But that, you can't get to it this morning, <laughs> right? Well, you know that's going to be the problem is once the battleship goes away. Meh. Yeah, the park is closed until the battleship clears the Lynchburg Ferry. Right. So, can't get there. Yeah. So, what's your vote? And where, where would you like to see it end up? Personally, yep. and this is just Brent Clanton, I'm not speaking as a, for the group or anything like that. I think Baytown would be the best choice because they want to put it next to the Fred Hartman Bridge. They're building a hotel there. They're creating a tourist destination mm -hmm. yep. and, and great visibility from the bridge. Right. So, I mean, if you happen to be a World War II buff, you know. Or World War One, Or World War One. That's yeah. true. That is true. Um, but if you happen to be a war buff and like these type of things, you know, the when I was growing history up. History buff. Yeah, history buff. Yeah. When I was growing up, you know, one of our kind of, you know, I grew up in Lake Jackson, which was about an hour south of Houston. But mm -hmm. one of our kind of regular annual trips was to come see the Battleship of Texas and then go eat at San Jacinto Inn because it had it was family style, all you could eat. My oh, dad loved yes. the catfish. It was so good. And yeah. still is. Right. So 
but yeah, that was a that was a thing growing up. Yeah, because we, we didn't have trips. we didn't have iPhones <laughs> back then <laughs> to stick our face in all day. We actually had to go out into the world and see stuff, and see things in real real yeah, time. You know, not yeah. on a three by five screen. You had to actually go see things in full view. Yeah. So, <laughs> what's that like? I know, right? <laughs> well, it's like now the kids want to watch these YouTube. Like we've banned YouTube in the house. Like mm-hmm. they want to watch YouTube of other kids like doing things. I'm like, what are you doing? Go outside and do these <laughs> things. Like, you're crazy. Like, no, this is fun. I'm like, no. A couple of weeks ago, I was in here doing some maintenance on the computers and stuff, and I had to generate a stream test. Uh-huh. And so I turned a camera on my editing computer and began to edit your audio <laughs> promos, and I had people watching that. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? Well, the one thing that gets me is that people watch people on YouTube unbo- unboxing stuff they bought from <laughs> Amazon. It's like, wow, can't wait for them to, to cut the tape and see what's in there. It's like, really? Oh, new spatula. Great. I'm unboxing vicariously. I know, right? It's just, it's just some of the stuff that attracts people. It's like, but <laughs> get the retail therapy a little different way. Mm-hmm. You know, but this is, this is the same problem we had growing up with our kids, right? You know, when, when I was growing up with, you know, when I was growing up, but when we had our kids growing up, you know, we would go on vacations and stuff together. And the whole time we're on vacation, you know, we're fighting with them. Get off your phone, get off your pad, get outside, you know, go do stuff. And, you know, you know, you're driving, you know, we're driving somewhere, right? And there's the whole world going past you and their faces are watching a TV on the back of a seat or, yeah. you know. I tell you what, it's not phone. just the kids, though, because my wife and I will go someplace and she's got her nose stuck in her phone and she'll look and she'll go, where are we? I know. It's like, you know, I, we, you have Google Maps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a rule that if, if it's not over, you know, it's going to be like a two to three hour trip. Mm. You're not pulling out of nothing's coming out. Now, my kids don't have devices, but we have a, one screen in the Suburban. And mm. I'm like, it's yeah. not coming down. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not taking Danny, a trip Danny, down the street. Danny's a hard ass. That's, is that is that screen in the Suburban a bed sheet? Uh, no, no. It should be. One of those fold downs. <laughs> we, had, we had that in our Tahoe, too. Oh, I know what it is. I'm just yeah. pulling his leg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, but it is, it's, it's, you know, you, you miss a lot. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. You learn how to get places. When I was riding around with my parents as a young child, we didn't have this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I learned how to get around Houston by just watching where we were going. Mm-hmm. People don't do that anymore. Exactly. Nope. Not at all. So it's a shame. Meanwhile, back on the show. Yeah. Anyway, so if you have any interest in the Battleship Texas, which is a very big drop piece me a of, line. Yeah, well, <laughs> drop us a line. We'll tell you where it is. But it's also just a, a great piece of history. I mean, just yeah, you should be able to see it in dry dock from Pier Twenty One. Now they, they'll have some screens up because they're going to be doing some remediation on the ship, and you might not be able to see too much but behind those screens. But you'll be able to see it from Pier Twenty One. Yeah. So how, how how much work are they actually doing? They're going to replace the hull. They're going to replace the deck, and they're going to do a paint job. So what does that cost? It's upwards of fifty million is my estimate on something like that. It's it's huge. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is a really old ship. So Steve on on YouTube just said it was launched on May eighteenth, nineteen twelve. Commissioned on March twelfth, nineteen fourteen. Mm-hmm. Saw action in Mexican waters following the Tampico incident and made numerous sorties into the North Sea during World War One. That's yeah, right. It's pretty neat. That's why that's why Brent was saying World War One and two. So it's yeah. seen it's seen a lot of action. She was launched. Uh, six weeks after the sinking of the Titanic, to give you a sense of time. Yeah. So, uh, don't want to break this to you, but Leonardo DiCaprio was already dead at that point. <laughs> what? <laughs> he had already slipped oh, off the God. door. <laughs> all right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, uh, all right, real quick. Warren Buffett turning 92, about as old as Battleship Texas. And he's not Gosh. getting... And he's not getting a new hull or a paint job. But <laughs> All the things money can buy. <laughs> he's not in dry dock either. Uh, but he does have some timeless advice, as always. Of course, and it's interesting today. People are tweeting out a lot of his, uh, his comments. Of course, you know, this is, you know, a guy that's seen a lot. College dropout. Bought a company called Berkshire Hathaway. It was a textile company. Um, wound up converting that into an investment vehicle and, you know, started buying up insurance companies. And he is a very interesting side note of this. You know, people always say, well, if you want to invest like Warren Buffett, you cannot invest like Warren Buffett. And here's why. Warren Buffett is one of the only people anywhere that has the ability 
to use insurance funds to invest in something else. Nobody else can do it. Even insurance, a lot of insurance companies don't even have that, that ability. But he has been around for so long and has so much clout that he is actually allowed to, when you buy insurance, he's actually allowed to use those reserves to invest in something else. But so not, that's not, why you can't invest like Warren Buffett. Yeah, but not only that, he makes his own deals. So, I mean, look, he's yeah. got a lot of timeless adages that I think are really good. But, he, you know, think I can't remember what company was that, Lance. Was it Wells Fargo several years ago? That Goldman Sachs, Probably a little bit longer than that. But he negotiated his own dividend. It was like 8%, yeah. well over what they were paying. And specific terms that you and I don't have that capability of doing. Right. Well, no, he, and he bet, look, he did a deal with Goldman Sachs during uh, the financial crisis, same way. Yeah. Bought preferred stock at a big discount and had options and warrants. And, you know, but again, when you, when somebody needs capital, right, you know, I'm in trouble, I need capital, you'll pay anything, you'll pay anything for the capital, right? And it's not necessarily a good deal for you, but it's a great deal for him. And again, this is, you know, they always say, if you want to invest like Warren Buffett, it's really easy. You start with a billion dollars, and then you go from there. The problem, the difference is, though, is that you start with a billion dollars, you'll probably wind up with five hundred million by the time you're done. He's going to wind up with two billion because he manages money very differently than the average person. He's not investing, and this is the big differential, right? He gives a lot of sage advice about just buy the S and P index over time, right? Just buy the S and P, and over time you'll make money, and he's right, you will. But that is that really investing advice? No, what he's saying is, and you know, they always say this is his advice to investors, just buy the S&P and hold it over time, you'll be fine. Always bet on the economy. That's right. But he's basically telling you you're too stupid to invest like him. <laughs> That's what he's really telling you. The best you can do is buy an ETF and hold it and make, you know, make average returns over time. But investing for him is a very different game. He's not buying stocks and bonds you know, just to you know, invest in the market. That's not what he's doing. You know, a big bunch of his money is buying businesses where he has a direct effect on the outcome of that business by making decisions for that company, combining this company with that company, finding a great manager to run that business, you know, buying businesses at a discount to fair value, all the things that, that you should do when you're, when you're investing buying at a discount, selling at a premium. He does that, but you can't. So, you know, there's all this really great advice that he gives out about investing long term. Buy when other people are fearful. Sell when they're greedy, right? Everything you don't do. You're, you're, you're not wanting to buy right now because you're worried about the markets going down some more. He's not worried about that. If he can find something cheap that's on sale, he'll buy it. And if it goes down some more, who cares? He's buying Occidental Petroleum, right? He now owns a 50% stake in Occidental Petroleum. And he doesn't care if the stock price goes down 20, 30% from here, he'll buy more. What he's betting on is where that stock price is going to be in 100 years. You don't have that kind of time frame. Berkshire, ha he doesn't have that kind of time frame, but Berkshire Hathaway will be here forever. It's a business. And it'll just move from one manager to the next manager to the manager after that. And its business will continue. But, you know, the, the timeless advice is fantastic. Just remember that you can invest like Warren Buffett. And so we have to take that timeless advice and invest it in a manner that we can do. We should buy cheap. We should sell rich. We should do all the things that Warren Buffett says to do, but within the context of how we can manage our own portfolio. That wraps up for today. Danny, thank you so much. Um, be sure you get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Check out simplevisor.com. That's our all digital solution. All of our research, our portfolios are there for you as well. 30 days free to try that out and get our latest articles, blog posts, newsletters, videos, more. Website, realinvestmentadvice.com.